they announced this week that they were actually shutting it down. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a couple weeks ahead of schedule, but it's important to note that given the conditions on the ground, they were only expected to have this go through about the middle of August mm -hmm. uh, based on conditions on the ground. That being said, from the time it became operational in mid-May to now, uh, it had only been operational for three weeks. Uh, and so during those three weeks, they were able to get significant amounts of aid uh, into Gaza. But at the same time, there were several weather issues that prevented it from being online. Welcome to Reporter's Notebook, where we talk with the Washington Examiner's top journalists about the stories they're covering this week. I'm Sarah Bedford, and I'm here with defense reporter Mike Brest. And Mike, this week, it's only been a few days since the assassination attempt against Donald Trump. And as if that story couldn't get any wilder, we learned that there was actually uh, an Iranian plot, potentially, or the U.S. had picked up intelligence yeah. of an Iranian plot to take Donald Trump out. Tell us what's going on there. So the first place to start is that <clears throat> all of this intelligence about an Iranian plot uh, to target pre former President Trump is completely separate from every indication from the actual assassination attempt that occurred last weekend. So that's the first place to start. There's no connection between the shooter mm -hmm. and Iran that any law for enforcement official has found. That being said, uh, we've learned through uh, different sources that the U.S. picked up chatter several weeks ago about a potential plot targeting the former president. As a result, uh, they actually beefed up his security, which is pretty hard to imagine given the <laughs> failures <we> <laughs> of, of the last week. Uh, and so who's to say what could have happened had they not actually beefed up the security, mm -hmm. right, when you think about the grand scheme of things. That being said, all of this uh, in intelligence about a plot targeting former President Trump dates back to 2020 wh when he was president with the assassination of uh, General Soleimani. And so at the time, Iran publicly vowed to seek revenge for his death. They specifically said they were targeting former President Trump. They, tar they said they were targeting his top advisors at the time, including uh, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper, National Security Advisor John Bolton, and then Robert O'Brien. Uh, we heard that there was a, this was a long list. Uh, and so this is actually just sort of a continuation of that threat. Uh, and so while we haven't heard much about it over the last years even, there have been little moments where things have happened that have shown that this is still an ongoing threat. Uh, and so a couple years ago, the DOJ unveiled an indictment targeting an IRGC official uh, who had offered to pay uh, what turned out to be a U.S. government informant $300,000 to, to arrange the killing of John Bolton. And so this is a very serious plot that we're just sort of seeing the latest iteration of. Now it's unclear what exactly this intelligence looks like at, given they're not declassifying it because it's still ongoing. Uh, that being said, all of these old Trump administration officials still have Secret Service protection. Uh, and so what we're seeing is that this is still an ongoing threat uh, that cu the current administration is now dealing with. What have the Iranians had to say about this? Have they come out and denied it? Um, you know, how, how has this affected the relationship there? So they have come out and denied it. That being said, they've also said that, he, that they do want to hold former President Trump accountable. Mm -hmm. It's not quite clear what that means or how that, what that would look like, uh, but on the one hand, they're saying they want to hold him accountable, but also denying that there is some sort of plot to kill him or hurt him. Um, also this week, you did some reporting on the much vaunted humanitarian aid pier that the Biden administration promised to build uh, to bring aid into Gaza. How's that going? Is it going well? So it's been a mixed bag mm -hmm. because they announced this week that they were actually shutting it down. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a couple weeks ahead of schedule, but it's important to note that given the conditions on the ground, they were only expected to have this go through about the middle of August mm -hmm. uh, based on conditions on the ground. That being said, from the time it became operational in mid-May to now, uh, it had only been operational for three weeks. Uh, and so during those three weeks, they were able to get significant amounts of aid uh, into Gaza but at the same time, there were several weather issues that prevented it from being online. Uh, and so uh, it really was sort of, sort of mixed results. You heard people who uh, were praising the amount of aid that they were able to get in through the pier. Uh, and in part, it's because there's no war zone going on in the Mediterranean Sea. It's a lot easier to navigate. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, the weather conditions, I think, proved uh, to be more challenging than they were expecting. 
Uh, and so now the new plan uh, of attack, which they believe is a more sustainable plan, uh, is that they will still use the uh, maritime route through the Mediterranean, uh, but instead of bringing aid through the pier, they're actually going to go to a port in Israel, uh, slightly north of Gaza, and then bring the aid via truck. Uh, and so this is a, uh, they sort of already done practice runs or pilot runs over the last several weeks, and ha they've shown that it's proven to be successful. However, uh, over the long run, we've seen uh, indications that they might be getting less aid into Gaza this way. Uh, now, this also doesn't get to the fact that one of the biggest issues that we were seeing as related to getting aid into Gaza was not actually getting aid to Gaza, but getting it moving throughout the Gaza Strip, uh, where there is a lot of lawlessness, there is an active war zone in several different parts of the country, uh, and it's really uh, hard for civilians and humanitarian workers to remain safe throughout those conditions. Uh, and so that's a big reason why the administration was pushing for a ceasefire deal uh, where humanitarian workers would be able to operate freely. Well, Mike, thank you so much for being here today. You can get more reporting from Mike and the rest of the policy team at WashingtonExaminer.com.